when a murder is left unsolved. You always think, have we missed something? What have we missed? And a killer is on the loose. To look at that individual and think he's capable of doing what he did is quite unbelievable. He carried out the last act of absolute total control, which is murder. Britain's cold case detectives will never give up. What else can we do? What else should we do to serve the family who've lost a loved one? He's obviously driven down here in the car and deposited her in the undergrowth. That's the unanswered question, isn't it? Why? Why did he do it? No matter how long it takes. This was the last throw of the, the forensic dice. They'll investigate every angle and uncover every clue. That seemed to be the missing piece of the jigsaw. Until the killer is caught at last. One hurdle after another, we were doggedly determined to succeed. A case like that will stay with you for the rest of your life. We were informed that a body had been found in the back of the car. There may be someone out there still committing offences. There's the family. They want answers. And the only people that can do anything for them now is the investigation team. The person who committed that offence does not deserve to get away with it. It's for us to use the tools that we've got today to get to the truth. Twenty-two-year-old Teresa de Simone is found murdered on the back seat of her car. This is what was the back of the Tom Tuckle public house, and really it's not changed that much um, since the day back in 1979. Her car was parked up near where that car is, underneath the, the arches there. So she'd left her car there. Her friend, who she'd been out on the night out with, came back, pulled up around about where I'm standing. She got out and walked back to her car. As far as her friend was concerned, she had a short distance to walk and she'd see her again the next day, but unfortunately, it, she never saw her again. Teresa was just a regular nice girl, but was working extra hours in the evening to make some extra money. Really, nothing different from her to the rest of the girls of our age at that time. She was a strong Catholic girl, brought up by mum and dad, strong Catholic upbringing. Teresa was working, that was one of her evenings in the pub, but she had plans to go out that evening with her friend when uh, the pub closed, sort of 11 o'clock time. So she went with her friend for a night out to a local discotheque in Southampton. It was about one o'clock in the morning that uh, her friend drove her back to the Tom Tackle where Teresa's car was parked. Dropped her off in the car park and saw her last walking towards her car before she drove away. Later that morning, the landlord of the pub, Tony Pocock, discovers Teresa's body. They lived over the premises, so he was the first one to find her. Must have been awful for him. I know that affected him very, very deeply, and I personally saw him several days later absolutely, utterly distraught. We lived and worked very close to where the murder occurred. It was really part of our community. It was our local pub. It was somebody we all knew. So it was quite a personal thing for us. At the time, it's, it was difficult to, to even comprehend who may be responsible for it. It was something that really did shock the city. People back then would have thought that Southampton was quite a safe city, few fights, 
but not murder. And it was quite a shock. The forensic team continued to process the crime scene. What evidence have we actually got? What can we do with it? Where is this going to take us? They established that some of her clothing had been removed and also that she'd been strangled in the car using a seatbelt. What they find during those examinations would tend to lead the investigation in certain ways, looking for hairs, looking for fibres, um, and looking for blood, because they could blood group blood uh, and indeed semen. Policing was a completely different beast at the time. There was no DNA, there was no CCTV and no phone evidence. They would speak to everyone who was in the pub, who was next door, house to house. They would knock on every single door and account for everyone in a local area as to where you were at the time of the offence and then try and work it from there. We used to have an appeal caravan. People would come along, we'd ask if they'd seen anything, gathering information, trying to see if there was anything that might link in, might be assistance to the incident room. I was working in that for several nights until two o'clock in the morning by myself, parked in front of the Tom Tackle. It was a really strange feeling because you knew that several days previously, a girl of a similar age had been murdered around the corner. The forensic samples showed that she was raped and those samples showed that the suspect had a rare blood group of group A secreta. But there was no database for blood groups. It was a matter of finding a suspect and then comparing their blood group to the crime scene stains. So it would only narrow it down once you've got a suspect and you can rule them out if they're not that blood group. It was a big shock to the city. Young girl murdered uh, in the back of the car. There was a murderer on the loose. Nobody knew who it was, where they were. Someone out there committed this offence. How do we find them? What do we do? The spotlight was on us. Hampshire police turned to the media and organized a reenactment of the night of the murder and asked Teresa's friends to help. We were hoping that by doing a complete reenactment of the night at the time exactly, people would have their memories jogged. I was asked to do the reenactment, I think because I was a similar height, build. It wasn't a pleasant experience. I found it incredibly difficult. There were a lot of media people taking photos uh, and also there were two very upset women who were having to reenact what had happened to them a week before. Theresa finished work at quarter to 11, and Jenny, her friend, came to pick her up from the pub. And we drove to Friday's nightclub, Southampton. We stayed there for an hour in the middle of the dance floor bopping about in the hope that somebody would remember seeing them. And then Jenny drove me back to the back of the Tom Tackle where Teresa had gone and, and Jenny drove off. It was quite a quite an emotional event, quite Quite difficult. Media coverage at the time was huge. As with many of these type of cases, 
uh, media coverage was very useful. It was a shocking event and obviously would have had a lot of public interest. You sort of like shake the tree, something might come out. If we make a few arrests, something might happen. Several men come forward and confess to the murder of Teresa. An awful lot of work goes into a confession and following that up. You, can, you don't just believe that's it and, and charge them and get on with it. That's not the way it works. They did follow-up inquiries and found out that actually they weren't telling the truth. They were just people that wanted to their moment in the spotlight and wanted to come and speak to the police. All of them had things that were wrong about the description of the car, the numbers of doors, the colour of the car, um, the description of Teresa, her clothing, the description of the scene in general. At that time, they only had a certain amount of forensic capability. They had blood grouping and forensic samples from Teresa, and they were aware of the blood group of the offender. Clearly, there were those who were not of the right blood group, so they were ruled out on forensic evidence. It's a bizarre concept why someone would admit to a murder so vile that they hadn't committed, and I'm not um, able to come to terms with that, really, that, that someone would do that. There were no charges brought. We didn't seem to be getting very far. I could feel the frustration. And then, unfortunately, as time went on, the scale of the operation reduced. During this investigation, uh, there was an unrelated matter where someone was arrested and charged with a number of theft from motor vehicles. His name was Sean Hodgson. These were thefts from motor vehicles on the night of the murder in Southampton. He wasn't interviewed about the murder at the time, uh, but was sentenced then to three years in Wandsworth prison. Sean Hodgson was known to the police for, for petty crime, basically nothing on this scale at all. Although the police were aware of him, he wasn't initially a high suspect. But whilst in custody, um, he confessed to this murder to both his priest and a fellow inmate. Detectives must now investigate yet another confession, this time from 28-year-old Sean Hodgson. It was written in Wandsworth Prison, and it says, After all the trouble I have caused, not only to you, the police, but myself, the mental torture I have gone through, the family of the person concerned, I must, for my own sanity and the punishment I will receive for this horrible crime, I wish now that it was me that was dead and not the person I killed at the Tom Tackle pub. I did the murder, why I don't know, so all I can say is let justice be done. Having got Sean's confession, that's not the end of the story because you've got to corroborate it. You, you can't just believe him straight away. The, he has to know something about the crime. He has to be able to tell you what's happened. Um, so you've got to then do all sorts of background work to work out whether that is a true confession or not. When an individual takes responsibility for their offending behaviour. We're looking for their level of insight into what they did and the impact it had on others. And this includes their level of remorse and empathy. We know that when Sean first confessed, his narrative contained a lot of information about specific details of the crime. In the interviews, he did mention details around the crime scene that made the officers believe he knew it, that he had actually been there. Sean Hodgson was able to give details of Teresa's car, of her clothing and of the jewellery that she was wearing on that night. These weren't details that were widely in the press at the time. It's why we will never disclose everything about a crime scene. We'll always hold something back because only the murderer will know that. So when that person confesses and, and mentions the bit that, we, that no one else knows, then you know you're onto a good thing. 
the blood sample was taken and indeed it showed that he was the correct blood group as was found on the crime scene stains from Theresa. The fact that Hodgson was in Southampton committing crime on the night of the murder, didn't live in Southampton and was of the same rare blood group of the offender, then all the planks of a, a strong conviction were, were in place. Sean Hodgson stands trial at Winchester Crown Court, charged with the rape and murder of Teresa de Simone. He now pleads not guilty. At the trial, Sean retracts his confession. We can hypothesise that he came in contact with the magnitude of the confession and the consequences that he was facing should he be found guilty of this horrendous crime. During the trial, Sean is given the opportunity to provide evidence and give his version of events. But he actually refuses to do so, stating that he's a pathological liar and as such he won't give evidence. I was very relieved to know that someone had been found to be guilty of the offence. I was annoyed it had taken so long, actually, but then I was glad that they've come to an end, particularly for her parents. Having made several unsuccessful attempts at appealing his conviction, Sean Hodgson continues to protest his innocence. During the course of his sentence being served, he repeatedly said that he hadn't committed the offence. And then in 2008 in the prison, there was a, a magazine or a newspaper for inmates that advertised solicitors and said that they may help with uh, miscarriages of justice if someone felt they were wrongly convicted. And clearly, Sean Hodgson saw that advert, then contacted the solicitors. He wrote to the police via his defence solicitors, basically saying, I know there's new advances in DNA, so can you do some new tests now to establish who's committed this murder? He was basically saying, if you tell me it was me, I'll, I'll stop trying to appeal and I'll stop saying that I'm innocent. My name's Tony Wyatt. I'm a criminal defence barrister. I've been practising since 2002, specialising in very serious crime. This was a high-profile case, a case that certainly locally attracted a lot of attention, but it also attracted quite a bit of attention nationally. If someone comes to the police with a murder confession, then the police have got no choice but to take it seriously. He'd already had an unsuccessful appeal. We know that every avenue that Sean Hodge could possibly really go down had been gone down. The only thing that was left to him was exoneration via DNA. There is a man in prison who for a quarter of a century has been saying, I didn't do that, I didn't do this. I didn't do this murder, I didn't do this crime. And so if we can just find that one sample and get it tested, we can find out if that's true or not. The problem really that everyone faces is where is this evidence now? Where is the real evidence? Where's the direct evidence? Where's the physical evidence? Back in 1970, they didn't know there was going to be anything called DNA or anything else like that. There was no legislation about how long they had to keep material. So as a result, exhibits are routinely thrown away after a few years. So it's a case of looking in the police doors for, for items that we've retained. Pre-1984, the reality is it just it was not like today. And so, yes, the players might not be there anymore, but more importantly, the evidence almost certainly won't be there anymore. You can't go back and talk to a witness, but you also can't go back and analyse a sample, apart from in exceptional circumstances. I can't begin to imagine the process that would be involved in trying to track down samples from 1979. Trying to restart an investigation such as this so many years after the fact is in in most circumstances a near impossibility i 
I was approached by Hampshire Police to look into the Tom Tackle murder to see if there was any material that the Forensic Science Service still held. When I asked our archive for what material they held, they found a crate in a big old warehouse containing files, which they sent to me. It's quite a deep crate. As I was working through the files, lifting them out of the crate and so on, it's to my surprise that I found right at the very bottom the leftover swabs from the intimate examination of Teresa Simone's body. It was the sort of material that would normally I would expect it to find in a freezer. Having found them in a crate, it was very much as if they were in preparation for the destruction process. And for whatever reason, they hadn't been destroyed. My immediate thought was, we've got something, we can do something with it. This is a big breakthrough. Those swabs were of high interest to us. The semen had been found on her sexual swabs. The semen was directly related to the offence and was directly related to the murderer. The samples from Teresa, the high and low vaginal swabs that were taken at the time, showing that she had been raped, were still in existence. The evidence should show the offender's DNA. The thing I was hoping for when I sent them off was to actually get a profile that we can actually work with. There was a risk that the DNA had gone off. The only way we would find out is to send the samples for analysis and to see what sort of results we would get back. We've got it. But what if it doesn't show what we hope it shows? Remember also the condition in which it was found. It wasn't found in clinical conditions. It was found amongst paperwork. Is it even going to be viable? Obviously, it's high stakes for Sean Hodgson. It's also high stakes for all of the police officers who were involved in that initial investigation and who believed that when Sean Hodgson confessed and when the jury found him guilty, that that was the true verdict. So there's a lot at stake when that scientific work begins. If they send them back, we found straight away that there was a full profile. I had to then compare it to the Sean Hodgson profile that we had, and I could see straight away that it wasn't a match. I realised the enormity that impact would have, and I telephoned the police investigators straight away. It showed that Sean Hodgson could not have been the person who raped and murdered Teresa. After 27 years in prison, DNA testing proves Sean Hodgson did not rape and murder Teresa in 1979. It was quite incredible, really, because for all of us that were involved, we thought that that was done and dusted, and the person that was responsible for that had been locked up. Job well done. I was shocked when I first heard that we'd locked up the wrong man, basically. When we first found that the, the DNA of the offender was not Sean Hodgson's DNA, uh, it was a shock to us because looking at the evidence at the time, it looked like they had the right person. I think at the end of the day, you want justice to be done properly. I think from the findings showed that Hampshire Police had done the very best they could at the time with the tools and the forensic tools that they had at the time. But also we were dealing with somebody that fully admitted on his part to murdering Teresa. Had the samples not been found, all we would have been left with is the extremely accurate confession of a man that we know was innocent. It would have been impossible to get past that. 
If this case occurred today, in exactly the same circumstances, the reality is there would have been no charge um, of Sean Hodgson, absolutely not. I mean, there's likely to have been an arrest, they would have investigated it, but by investigating him, they'll then take his DNA. Someone's got away with this, and someone's got away with this for the last 30 years. When we look back at Sean's original confession, we can see that it was not only false, but it was voluntarily made. Sean may have been suffering from symptoms of a mental illness, which made it difficult for him to separate fact from fantasy. But we can wonder how he knew so much about the crime. We can speculate that Sean may have been in the area and actually witnessed the crime. Rather than come forward and help the police, he created a narrative where he placed himself at the centre. And we know, probably because he was in the area when it occurred, that Sean Hodgson particularly took the headlines and built a fantasy around them. There was one witness who had seen a man vomiting in the street, and there was another witness who had seen a man um, sitting in the curb crying that night. My hypothesis is that could well have been Sean Hodgson having found the body. That's just my supposition, taking into account the facts we have that could possibly explain how Hodgson was able to give details of Teresa's car, of her clothing, and of the jewelry that she was wearing on that night. There's no real explanation for why it was that he got so much right, but he did. What can't be ignored is how many confessions he made. I mean, he spoke to a priest, then he spoke to a solicitor, then he spoke to a prison officer. Then he handed in two exercise books full of detail. Quite a lot of it was probably inconsistent, but so much of it was consistent that the police really had no choice but to take it seriously. He'd spent nearly half his life in prison. On his first day of freedom, he was barely able to stand on the steps of the Court of Appeal. He had to be supported by his brother, Peter. He came out to the world of 2009, which was so very, very different. And to think that he lost all those years for something he didn't do. But then to think, and this must weigh on his mind, that he also lost all those years to an extent for something he did do, which was giving a false confession to an offence that he hadn't committed. Who knows what would be on that man's mind? Who knows what effect that would have upon him? On behalf of my brother, I would like to thank the solicitor a million, million thanks. And what I would like to say, I've had a dream for 27 years. I know it's a hell of a long time, but it's finally come true. It can be a really sort of, you know, difficult situation for somebody who gets their conviction quashed. When I met him, he was a very sad and vulnerable man. I didn't really see anger and bitterness from him, but I didn't spend a huge amount of time with him. You know, what I saw was somebody who was just hugely confused. He didn't know how to be a normal person, you know, because he'd never been one. He spent all of his adult life in prison and he had huge mental health problems when he went in and they were only exacerbated by those 27 years of being on prison wings and in psychiatric wards, you know, trying to get people to listen to him. So when Sean was released, he was actually the longest serving person as a result of miscarriage of justice. So that created a lot of press interest. The headline is, we've got it wrong. We've locked up the wrong person for almost 30 years. The spotlight was on us. We had to make sure that we righted that wrong, that we actually investigated this to find out who was the killer. I think it was very sad for Teresa's family because they had been through all of that initially. They had a form of closure. They felt that the job had been done and that everything had been dealt with. And then, of course, everything changed. That was it, as far as they were concerned at the time. Well, I still blame Hodgson, though. He hadn't confessed. 
you know, the well, police would have carried allowed. on. The ball was then batted back to the police because these cases can't go unsolved if there's a possibility of solving them. We can't forget uh, Teresa de Simone died. We can't forget the terrible death that she suffered. We can't forget the atrocity of this crime and we can't forget the impact on her family. It was important for us as Hampshire Constabulary to solve this. There's an offender. There's, there's someone out there that's committed this offence. How do we find them? What do we do? When the cold case review started, initially it was a forensic review. Then we went further into the case papers, which have something over 2,500 statements, a uh, huge amount of reports to go through. We then loaded those up onto the Holmes system, the major crime system, to en enable us to make the evidence from 1979 searchable and then compiled a list of uh, people of interest. We've got obviously a DNA result. Let's search the National DNA Database to see if anybody on the database matches this DNA. Anyone that's committed a crime or been arrested for a crime uh, has their DNA taken and that's put on the database and that stretches back a long time now, over 20 years. So that search was done and that was negative. Anyone that's on the database was not our murderer. The fact that we didn't get a hit on the National DNA database means he's not an active criminal in this country. He could have gone abroad, obviously, but certainly if he stayed in this country, he hasn't been arrested or committed any crimes in, in recent times. We're not looking for uh, anyone that's an active criminal. So now we're at a stage of what can we do to identify who matches the DNA. In 2009, familial DNA searching was well established. And I'd suggested to the police that the next stage is to run a familial DNA analysis on this unknown stain. Familial search looks at people on the database that are close to the DNA result you've got. And what it will do, it will give you two results. It gives you people on the database that could be a father of your murderer or someone that may be a sibling of your murderer. When the unknown profile was put in, we realised from the sibling search that we had someone that could potentially be the sister of the unknown profile. Once we give that to the police, then they would do their research, find out if there's a male relative, and obtain a DNA sample from him. On reviewing the sibling list, there was one name, or actually the, the, the sister of a person, that stood out, and, and that was the name Lace. That was significant because on reviewing the original material, the name Lace appeared, a David Lace because he'd been interviewed and had actually confessed to the murder. The DNA of a man called David Lace has been linked to the samples taken from the body of Teresa de Simone. The DNA that ultimately leads us to David Lace is actually his sister's DNA. His sister committed a low-level crime, got that DNA on the database, and it allowed us to identify David Lace. David Lace appears in police files as one of several men who confessed to the murder. He was actually only 17 at the time of the murder. It was our job to review the evidence that was available from the original investigation. In his interview with the police at the time, he had got detail wrong of the car, of Teresa's position in the car, of her clothing. And also at the time, it was 1983 when he made his um, admissions, Hodgson was already convicted of the offence. So at the time, he was ruled out. At the moment, all we've got 
is Lace is a familial match to the crime scene. Until we actually can get his DNA, we can't provide any evidence that that DNA is his. So we need now to get hold of his DNA. So how do we do that? The obvious way is to locate Lace, arrest him, get him into custody and take his DNA. There's lots of research done then to try and locate David Lace. Where is he? Who's his friends? Who's his family? Where does he live? Where does he work? Where's he been? Where was he at the time of the offence? What do we know about him? Let's do a whole background package because although at this point we know the name David Lace, he doesn't know that we know it. He was in custody for theft-related offences. He was released, but then he committed robbery and then was convicted the following year of a knife point robbery at a post office. Um, and he served his sentence at Dartmoor Prison, where he was released in 1987. He then relocated to Brixham, where he worked as a, a fisherman. And then in December 1988, uh, having made lots of connections in the Brixham area because of his work. He told a number of friends that he was moving on. He wouldn't say where he was going. Let's come up with a strategy to get his actual DNA to compare it against the crime scene. So we've then got some evidence with a potential then to take it to the Crown Prosecution Service and say we should charge this man. Now that we've found a sister and the link to a brother, we now need to find David Lace. There was a lot of pressure on the police to investigate this, so this was a large inquiry. There were a large number of detectives working on it. Also, they're spreading their net wider and wider, and they search their databases to find what they've got. The media coverage at the time was, was huge. Obviously, their interest turned to, well, OK, um, you got it wrong 27 years ago. What are you going to do now? And so, the spotlight was on us. Um, however, um, as with many of these type of cases, uh, media coverage was very useful in finding people. Eventually, we'd found the sister, and that led us to our brother David. But David Lace was dead. Significantly to us, he commits suicide on the anniversary of Teresa's death. His sister then told us what David had told her back in 1988 before he committed suicide. And that was that he had committed a murder in Southampton and he couldn't live with what he did anymore. Given that David Lace took his own life, presumably due to the level of guilt he felt about what he'd done to Teresa, maybe this was an uncharacteristic behaviour from him. He doesn't necessarily fit the typical profile of a sexual offender because this was an isolated incident, one that he confessed to, and one that he continued to feel guilty about for years afterwards. So those facts led us to believe we had the right man, but we needed the DNA to prove it conclusively. The fact that he was dead was really complicated in that we couldn't just go to him and get his DNA. We had to try and get his DNA from another way. It may have been someone had kept something of his. We could find some items of clothing or some mementos of his that he'd had that might allow us to get a DNA profile. But unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we drew a blank and we couldn't get his DNA. The only way we could get DNA from David was to exhume the body and get DNA from his remains. To exhume the body, there are a number of legal obligations you've got to go through. We needed the agreement of the family. We needed the Ministry of Justice to agree, the coroner, environmental health, health and safety, and the assistant chief constable. It was a huge process to pull together before we could do that. It was, in fact, my task. I just brought the whole thing together, so um, it was a lot of long days for a period of time, but we didn't want it to last too long. We wanted to get it done, so it was... I was cajoling 
the Ministry of Justice and people like that to, to make the decision. And they saw that it was you know, a, an important one to do. David Lace's body was taken from the cemetery to the mortuary where the following morning the pathologist performed a post-mortem in order to obtain a sample of his DNA. Although David had been dead a number of years, uh, the DNA is still preserved in bone marrow. So the scientists are able to get DNA from the marrow that exists within the bones, even all these years later. For the exhumation, I briefed the police that they would need to send us the thigh bone and also a tooth, the molar. Those two items are the areas where the DNA is preserved best in skeletal remains. And that's what they did. They sent those samples into the lab for analysis. When the results came back, the DNA profile was a complete match to the crime scene DNA, meaning that David Lace was the killer. After all these years, we'd actually got to the truth. We put the case to the Crown Prosecution Service who agreed that they would indeed charge David Lace if he was alive today. We could say this was the offender. It's great that we've achieved that ultimate end result. We've got to the truth and proper justice has been done in the end and that um, Theresa's parents know what happened to her and who was responsible for that before they passed on. Obviously the fact that David's dead means we can't interview him. We can't find out from him why he did it. But what we do know is at the time of the murder, he was only 17. And from what we understand, it was a random act that he'd found Teresa in her car at the back of the Tom Tackle pub at the time. What's happened is Teresa's been dropped off just by the back gates up there. And what we do know is that David walked uh, at some point from Portsmouth over to Southampton, but we don't know brought, what brought him into this quiet little area, really. But What's happened is she's only had a few seconds to walk from her back gate to her car, but in that time, David's seen her and managed to accost her. How or why, we don't know. We don't know David Lace's exact motivation for killing Teresa. However, if we look at it within a wider context, we know the night before he stole cash and property from his lodgings. Maybe he needed money. He may have seen Teresa approaching her car and saw an opportunity for a quick robbery when Teresa resisted, he may have become angry and in an attempt to silence her, strangle her. We know for some people, violence and sex can be closely linked. Following strangling Teresa, David may have found himself in a state characterized by anger, but also sexual arousal. And this may have motivated him to act in ways that he never conceived before. He'd had no previous interaction with Teresa. She'd done nothing to bring this on. She was literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. You just can't comprehend it, can you? This is just a complete random shock. You just can't feel anything but sympathy for the family. It was just horrendous. And it was quite a shock to realise all this time we'd had the wrong man. So it was really pleasing to actually finally solve the riddle and, and make right what, what had gone wrong. This was a cold case that we had to solve. For the team, th there was a huge lift, a feeling of celebration, but equally tinged with a huge sadness that a that, that Teresa was raped and murdered all that time ago, that b that somebody has spent 27 years in prison for having not committed the offence, but a relief that that we we did get to the truth in the end. Mm -hmm.